What's up, everyone? Thanks for joining me today for lesson number four in our series about getting going as improvisers on trombone. Today, we're gonna to continue looking at how we can build strong melodies with just a limited number of notes. In lesson three, we looked at how we can use just a small number of notes to build great melodies. Today, we're actually gonna talk about how we can practice some of those things to get them into our playing consistently. Just as a very quick review, in lesson three, we covered these two four note groupings. Now those are both in B flat and we talked about the many different ways that we can sort of just manipulate that very small amount of information to create some really great ideas. If you use just those four notes or those two groupings of four notes, I should say, you can actually create some solo ideas that sound a little bit like this. For this, we want to look at what I consider to be one of the central characteristics of how we learn to improvise, its connection to how we learn language. Some of these small melodic ideas, we're going to refer to them as vocabulary. Now, some people might call them licks or phrases, but I really love that word vocabulary because it connects to this sort of language idea. When we learn a language, we mostly learn by listening. We listen to others, we emulate them, we apply those things that we learn by listening, and then eventually we sort of reach understanding about the technical nature of the language, sort of how it's constructed and how we can sort of manipulate it to communicate. This is the same process for us as improvisers. We wanna learn by listening to great players, essentially just do what they did. And then over time, by sort of absorbing all that information, we will eventually learn to find our own voice and how to use these ideas in a multitude of ways. Today, we're gonna to start with simple phrases, simple pieces of vocabulary. Things that if we thought about our speaking language, it might be like, hi, my name is Sean, where's the bathroom? We have to learn these simple phrases first and through them, we can understand a little bit about the construction of what's going on in the language as a whole, just like we're going to today with improvisation. All right, since we're talking about vocabulary, we want to think, well, what is vocabulary? Or what kind of makes something an item of vocabulary that might make it something we want to learn and actually practice? For me, it has three characteristics. It is short, it is concise, and it is memorable. It being short just means that it's probably going to fit into a relatively confined space musically, maybe a measure, two measures, possibly four measures. But usually shorter ideas are great because we can manipulate them and sort of build on them. A very long idea is gonna be hard to sort of expound upon as we continue to grow as improvisers. When we talk about an idea being concise, it has a clear beginning and ending. Maybe a middle, depending how long it is, but that clarity of like, I start an idea, I'm done with an idea, and then I rest is something we really wanna listen for when we're thinking about what is vocabulary. And then finally, it is memorable. It is something that from day to day, we can remember and practice. Ideally, maybe you wanna write some of this stuff out and sort of have like a list of vocabulary that you're working on. But then also when it comes to the audience, when they hear something, can they sort of like connect with that phrase? Does it resonate with them as something they might be able to like sing back to you? Those are the type of ideas we wanna practice in a vocabulary type of mindset. The best way to understand this is just to hear some of these ideas. So let's check out a few little pieces of vocabulary that are based on our two four note groupings. I'm gonna start with our first grouping. That one is these four notes. Now, just like we did in the last lesson, we kind of like manipulated these to build some melodies. I just chose a couple that I like the way they sound and I thought they kind of fit our qualifications of what is vocabulary. Let's check out just a few of these. Now, by no means are those the only pieces of vocabulary you can build off of these four notes. There's sort of maybe not an endless number of them, but there are many of them. And really anything that you can build that is a melody that you gravitate towards, that your ear is like, ooh, I like that. You could think about it being a piece of vocabulary. All right, let's look at the same thing in our second grouping of notes. So that four note grouping was this. So these pieces of vocabulary are going to sound inherently different because they're drawn from a different set of notes. And that's really what we want to think about any grouping of notes that we choose, whether it's a very limited number like we're doing now, whether it's a scale, whether it's an arpeggio, they're hopefully just leading our ear towards different melodic ideas, different pieces of vocabulary. So let's check out a couple um, with this little grouping of notes. <laughs> Now, 
Now, just like we talked about in the last lesson, sound, articulation, feel, these are the things that are really important. Yeah, our note choices are important, but if these other things aren't working, these ideas might not land very well. Let's look at the third idea I played here and see if I change the articulation, if it sort of feels as good. The notes are there, the piece of vocabulary is there, but it just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel swinging in the same way that if we're a new speaker of a language and we don't understand the accent, understand the inflection, understand the pacing, you know, somebody who's a native speaker is going to be able to tell, oh, they don't quite have it together yet. And that's not good or bad. We're all in the process here. So we just want to think about how can we make that feel a little bit better. So when I first played it, I played da, 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 do, da, da, really thought about articulation, long note, short note. So it ends up sounding more like this. That just gives this little idea a lot more soul and feels a lot more authentic. So there's a couple examples of some vocabulary. Feel free to steal those. That is part of how we learn as jazz musicians is we listen to players who are more experienced than us and we sort of gain information from them. The question might be, how do we practice this stuff? These bits of information, you want to practice almost like you would practice a scale, but with more of an effort to internalize them rather than just memorize them. By internalize, I mean that you can recall these at any time in your solo instantaneously. There can be no little kind of half second of thought about these or else you'll miss your opportunity where you're hearing that idea in your head and you want to be able to apply it. If there's that little bit of thought, you'll miss that chance and it will always sound like you're kind of like fumbling for ideas. So a lot of repetition is needed here. So when we're moving these into the practice room, the first step you have to take is to work them with a metronome. I'm going to say that again for the people in the back. You have to practice these with a metronome. There's no sidestepping this. It is one of the most important things you can do to just improve your overall musicianship. And you want to work these so that you can apply them at any tempo. Start slow, speed the tempo up until you feel that you reach a place of confidence at any tempo. Second thing you got to do, I already mentioned, a lot of reps. I think this is one of the key areas that people struggle when they're working on improvisation is they don't quite connect with how many repetitions you often need on some of these small concepts. If you were practicing an etude or a solo that is written out, you could kind of work an eight bar chunk a couple times, maybe slow it down, speed it back up and see some real progress. These elements, you might need to practice them over and over and over and over, over weeks or even months in some case before you're going to see a lot of improvement where they start to come out in your playing naturally. So the number of reps you have to do on these cannot be overstated. The final part of practicing these bits of information is to sing and to use your voice. Whether you think you're a great singer or a horrible singer, I tend to think I'm not a super great singer. Um, I've never had great control of my voice, but I use this all the time to practice. If we can connect with what these sound like orally, not even worrying about what notes we're playing on our instrument, we have a much better chance of landing them in our solo and hearing that idea organically, which is what we want. Let's take one of these ideas and move it through that process. So I'm gonna put a metronome on and I'm gonna play it just a number of times. I might sing it, I might play it, I might talk a little bit. Let's just see how I would go about practicing one of these ideas. The idea I'm gonna use sounds like this. Now I'm gonna play this in my upper octave, but you can play in whatever range works for you. All right, here we go. Just playing the lick a couple times. Once more. Now I'm really focused on feeling the time, thinking about inflection. I might sing it once. Two, three, four. Da do da da do da do da. Now I could be a little more pitch accurate. I'm not so worried about that. It's all about is that feel kind of where I want it and is the shape of the idea right. One more time singing, I might check my B flat again to make sure I'm starting on the right note. Two, a uh, one, two, three, four. Da do da da do da do da. That's feeling pretty good. I'm gonna play it again. Two, three, four. Now I've been going to my upper octave. I might want to try my lower octave just to make sure I can play it all over the horn. A uh, one, two, three, four. Ooh, let's try one more time. Two, a uh, one, two, three, four. 
There we go, again. Two, uh, one, two, three, four. So that was with a metronome. What if we want to put this into a little bit more of a musical context? Let's try applying some of these on a B-flat blues. We haven't really talked about the blues yet here, but if you're somebody who's in that early stage of improvisation, you've probably started to think about this song form. If it's new information, don't worry, just use your ear. If it's information you know, you'll hopefully be able to connect maybe some of the chords or the song form to the information that we are talking about. So we are gonna take our same idea and we are going to plug that lick in in a few places, meaning that we're gonna preconceive where we are going to put it, kind of, you know, square peg, round hole. We're just gonna put it there, whether it totally fits or not, just so we can get in the habit of like, how does this sound against some chords? How does this sound against a rhythm section playing? We're gonna play two choruses of our 12 bar blues. That's gonna be 24 measures. The first time we are gonna plug our lick in at the beginning of each four bar phrase, and then we are going to rest for the rest of it. We are just gonna worry about landing that lick. And I'll kind of talk us through this so that we're together in the same place. And I'll encourage you maybe play along. We're gonna use that same little lick that we just played, that same piece of vocabulary. For our second chorus, I'm actually gonna improvise in between where I play that lick. I'm gonna plug it into the same place, which is gonna be at the beginning of each four bar phrase, and then I'm gonna improvise the rest of that phrase. My emphasis is going to be, am I getting to that lick in the right place each time? So I might improvise a little more simply so I have some space that I can kind of like get back to the idea in the right place. Let's hear what all this would sound like. We'll do the two choruses back to back. Now I'm gonna wait till the next phrase. A one, two, three. Again, really thinking about feel, rhythm. Now I'm gonna fill in those rests with some soloing. These two approaches, working with a metronome and working with a play along, whether it's a blues or some other tune where you actually decide where you're going to plug in a certain idea, and again, cram it in there, whether it's musical or not, to start with is how you want to get these into your playing. Now, this is very non-musical. This is really putting yourselves in a little box to practice in. That's super important. It's really important that when we practice this stuff, we set parameters that we have to meet. That's going to allow us to see, am I actually improving? Then eventually, you kind of get rid of those training wheels and you just see if you can use these ideas in a more organic fashion or you just forget about them and wait for them to come out and you're playing naturally. That's the process for most of us. All right, to finish things up today, let's talk about our listening example that's gonna illustrate some of these concepts. Today, we are gonna to listen to the great Curtis Fuller. Curtis Fuller had a long and illustrious career playing with many of the greats through the 50s, 60s, 70s and beyond. We are going to look at something relatively earlier in his career. This is from the album called The Opener. The tune is called Hugor, or at least I think that's how you say it. It's H-U-G-O-R-E. It is a B-flat blues. And listen to at least the first couple choruses of Curtis's solo. You will hear very, very clear vocabulary, similar to what we're playing today. Curtis relies on relatively simple ideas, similar to what we're doing today, that he can then kind of develop and extrapolate upon to sort of like create the flow of this solo. It doesn't just sound like a bunch of random ideas. It's like he starts with a simple idea, develops it, and that kind of like makes his solo have a direction. That's what we want to think these items of vocabulary are great for. I put that link down in the description so that you can just click on it and access that video nice and easily. All right, that's it for today. As always, if you enjoy this content, hit like, hit subscribe, do all the good YouTube stuff, and be sure to check us out in the virtual studio. Every week there's a handout, some etude material on some of these lessons, and also an additional practice lesson that goes along with this, where you and I will work on some of this stuff together in a more practice way. We'll get a lot of reps through some of these things, look at some different ideas, all that type of good stuff. All right, we'll see you in the woodshed.